I think, I think this is um, quite interesting for us because as Tammy said, um, myself, William, and Josh here were former TSI employees. We've, we're all here at Comfort now. Um, we've got a slide here. We're going to talk about that in a sec. Um, but, but what we want to talk about is um, the, the database, managing the database, distributing the database, and um, keeping it updated for users um, in the most efficient manner possible. Okay, And we're going to go through some numbers here um, of where we're at here at Comfort, what we've done. Uh, I'm thinking it'll be quite striking for some of you to, to understand where we're at, the numbers that we're, that we're dealing with here. Um, but at the same time, I want everybody to understand that even though we're dealing with the numbers and the, the amount of companies that we have going here, I, I think the, the moral of the story is that it can be done and we're doing it and we want people to do it as well. Just not just us, but we, you know, we want we want people to understand that that what we've got going here um, it is not just unique to comfort, but um, can also be utilized for some of you um, who may have two or three detailers, you may have 15 detailers at your, at your organization, but um, we, we, want, we want people to understand what we do, how we do it, and then um, we go from there. So let's talk about comfort first, okay, just a little bit of history of who comfort is and the markets that we're in and what we do, right? Um, so, um, installation and service, so we do, we do both of those are about equal. Um, $1.6 billion annual revenue, okay? Um, seeing if I can find my pointer here, yeah, there it is. Over 7,000 employees nationwide, okay? Um, there's a total of 36 operating companies across the United States. Uh, we currently work with, I believe the number is 24 or 25. Uh, we're going to see a slide here in a minute. Um, so that makes you question, well, what about the others? Well, some of those others are just service companies, so they're not doing any um, virtual construction modeling, prefabrication of any sort, at least at this point in time from a service standpoint. Okay, They're just a, a, a service organization. Um, so um, when, when we look at this, um, we get to go on boats every once in a while? <laughs> no, just kidding, just kidding. Um, so keep in mind, all the red dots are, are operating company locations, and, and the slide was probably set up so they could um, highlight and put the names beside each one of the organizations, so they had to put some of them out of the, uh, of the East Coast here, because, uh, you know, geographically, you can see East Coast versus, you know, Central and West Coast, we have a lot more operating companies in that. It, it's due to the nature of the population, right? I mean, first off, there's just more people there, right? <laughs> so, uh, therefore, we have um, uh, more operating companies in, in that neck of the woods, so to speak, right? So, um, you can see here, you know, 94, 94 total locations with 36 companies. So, obviously, some branches, right? Some separate organizations there. Um, but still all fall under the single umbrella. The corporate office happens to be in Houston, Texas. Okay? I live in San Antonio, Texas, about three hours away. I've been here for almost two and a half years. I went to that office when I, when I did an interview to hire, and I've been there one other time. <laughs> the rest of the time, as well as these two guys, we spend our time on the road traveling to one of those dots somewhere across the United States, usually on a weekly basis, okay? We're going to one of those organizations doing training, uh, software setup, productivity enhancements, whatever it may be that that particular organization needs at that time, okay? So, um, where are we at? As well as you, every building you see needs what we do, right? We're in the MEP industry. That building's going to need heating, cooling, working toilets, whatever it may be, right? So we're in the same market you're in. We're doing the same things you do. Um, and so let's talk about 
who we are and how, how this all came about, okay? So since I'm up here first, I'll start with myself. Um, I was a fitter by trade in, in the industry, uh, worked in the field for quite a few years, um, started detailing, uh, doing 3D models in the early 2000 uh, time frame, late, late 90s, early 2000. Um, it didn't even have a name back then, right? It wasn't called BIM. We were doing it because we were prefabricated, and, and I was on the piping side, so we were producing 3D models just so we could send that to the shop and prefabricate it. There was no other reason. We weren't coordinating with anybody. We were doing it internally as a benefit for us, okay? Uh, so I was fortunate enough to work at that company for seven or eight years, uh, left there, came to TSI, so some of you may recognize me from my TSI days as well as these two guys. Uh, so I was with TSI for about six years uh, doing first off training, then um, moved into the sales side and helped with you know getting new companies on board for TSI with the uh, what's now a fabrication product suite, right? Um, and parted ways about two and a half years ago, I think is when that happened, and started here at Comfort. I've got some slides later that will actually go through what, what, what happened when I first got here, and uh, we'll talk about a little bit of that. But before we do, uh, let's go to Josh, and we'll let Josh introduce himself here. And he doesn't have a mic, but maybe he does. There we go. All right. So as Kevin said, <coughs> excuse me, my name is uh, Josh Hashey. Um, been uh, uh, tender by trade, or I am tender by trade, um, did a uh, union apprenticeship um, pretty much right out of high school, worked at a uh, sheet metal fabricator for about 13 years, um, full HVAC, mechanical contractor, um, spent about half my time in the shop, the other half my time in the field, um, doing uh, all sorts of various various tasks, tasks. Um, then came over to uh, TSI, uh, as Kevin also mentioned, um, did some uh, some training on the fabrication products, and then uh, also moved into uh, the sales the sales side of things as well. Um, and then about two and a half years ago as, as well, I moved over here to uh, to Comfort Systems to uh, to assist Kevin in his new uh, endeavor um, with uh, trying to support all of Comfort Systems using the uh, Autodesk fabrication software. Um, and uh, traveling around um, pretty much on a weekly basis to different operating companies, helping them out with, with, with whatever it may, with whatever, uh, it may be that they're, they're looking to do or accomplish that, that particular uh, time we're there. William? All right. <clears throat> yeah, I'm uh, William Tucker. And <coughs> I started off, I guess, in the oil fields right out of high school. And then in the late 80s, I moved to Tennessee as a pipe fitter welder and worked for a company called Lee Company. And ended up working there for, for 18 years. And, and started out, I guess, as a pipe fitter welder, went into a, a superintendent role, and then went in and started a detailing department. And as Kevin was saying back then, there was not a name for it, it was a detailing department. We didn't get paid for it, it wasn't in the bid, we just saw it as a benefit to us to get our job done a little bit easier, more proficient to, to fabricate the piping. And I guess I, I left there and came back to Texas and went to work for uh, coming REC as a mechanical contractor also. Then hired on with TSI, worked for them I think six years as well, six or seven years. And then uh, was right after Kevin and hired on Comfort and hired on, hired on Josh. I think we figured it was what, three, 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 three with two months apart. Yep. I think that's how we hired on. And this was all instigated by Dave Bolton here, by the way. This has got kind of Comfort's vision and Dave's vision and, and Dave's done a real good job at making sure that we did our job to bring the software up where he wanted to see it. Yep. Yeah, so, um, yeah, good. I think just going through that, we we'll just want people to understand that that we're not just software guys, we're not just technology guys. 
as a, as are you know you sitting here in this room, but we're industry guys, right? And it takes the industry and the knowledge and the understanding of what we do on a daily basis out on that job site to be able to build, set up, distribute, maintain this database to make it the most effective that it can be, right? If we don't set it up properly, then the tool's no good, right? It's only as good as the data you can provide with it, right? So um, let's talk about let's talk about some of our duties and responsibilities here at Comfort Systems, okay? So um, when we talk about the software side, okay, we're talking about services, service templates drawing templates, reports, right? Data exports. Um, all of the things that apply in the software side, okay? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna highlight a couple of these because we're gonna talk about standards here in a minute. How many of you struggle with set up, setting up standards at your company? Yeah, I, 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 I suspected a little bit more hands than that. <laughs> I expected a little more hands than that. Um, for those of you who have got it down pat, kudos, okay? <laughs> Great job. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, we're gonna talk about some of those things here in a minute and, and some of the struggles that we go through here at Comfort Systems, okay? Um, so, um, as you see here, a lot of things that we do at what, what's considered the, semi-corporate level that now we distribute to all of our operating companies around the United States, okay? So we take care and update, manage all of these things, okay, from our side. And on the production side, now we're looking at productivity suggestions, resource sharing, okay? Think about this. We're, we're one organization, Comfort Systems, <laughs> multiple operating companies around the United States and we're using one database okay so what that means for that line item right there is I can have somebody sitting in Washington DC draw a job for somebody in California and I can download that ductwork and burn it and not have a problem because it's the same database going from company A to company B okay that was a huge hurdle okay that was a huge hurdle okay that's why it's taking three of us to get this done here at Comfort Systems, okay? <laughs> so, um, some of the other things we do, right? Oops, sorry, got, got ahead of myself. Uh, Trimble training, right? We, we do that ourselves internally. Uh, we're fortunate enough that we, we were here at TSI. We knew, we knew how that uh, uh, system works. We can now train all of our uh, operating companies on that. We deal with the sheet metal shops, the plumbing shops, and mechanical piping shops on you know production, productivity, as Dave was saying earlier. Um, when, when Dave was here, um, you know, we, we kind of lost a, a, a cog on the wheel, so to speak, when, when Dave left. Or, and uh, so now we pick up that slack, right? Um, and, and it's just another thing that falls into our um, portfolio, if you will, of the things that we do for comfort systems, okay? So, we're gonna talk about how we build services, how we build templates, what we're doing with, you know, updating pricing, updating labor, all of those good things. Um, but in order, in order for all of this to be effective, we have to have the right content, okay? So, when we talk about Content. We're going to get into it. You know, who who builds it? How do we how do we um, how do we manage it? And how we distribute it? And is it is it usable and accessible? And um, it's a term I'm looking for. Um, it's valid, right? It has all the data we need in it to do our job. Okay, so. Um, content is both information and communication, right? And it's a sum of, right, so everybody can read, presented in the manner, okay, 
So, what is content? Or what is content? How do you say it? Right? Same word, different meaning, right? Are you satisfied with what you have? Are you content with your content? <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, all right? So, <laughs> um, the graphics are brilliant. My content is poor. Or my content. I'm not very happy. You could take that either way, right? <laughs> yeah? It, RJ, you like that? RJ's giving us a thumbs up back there in the back, right? So, RJ likes that slide, okay? So, as it says right there, okay, we would not be able to do, distribute, manage, do the things we do without having content of some sort, whether we build it or whether we don't build it, okay? We have to have the data in our database, right? It's the only way it works, okay? So, let's talk about managed versus unmanaged, right? So, it, it, it was eye-opening um, to us when we started distributing, okay, that what we had locked versus what we didn't have unlocked, okay? And when we started this rollout of this database, um, we were using building data, okay? We still are today, okay? That was locked content. That was managed content, okay? And we didn't have to worry about any of our users making any modifications to that content. We knew whenever we got it out there that it was going to be as is, right? Nobody was modifying it, okay? But on the sheet metal side, that was unmanaged content. So it was open, okay? What did we have? We had operating company on the East Coast say, well, I want a four-inch throat on my square on my square foot level, so he goes in and edits the fitting and changes it to a, to a four-inch throat. Guess what he did? He just changed it for everybody that's using our software, okay? Bad deal for us, okay? And I would suspect a bad deal for you, okay? If we're going to have standards, we need to be able to set what we want, and for it to stay there, right? We don't need to spend our time going back time and time and time again, changing the same fitting over and over again, okay? Everybody would probably agree to that, right? We got better things to do than to go back and keep changing that elbow from a six to a four, okay? So, um, when, when building data allowed us to remap our drive, so, so for those, how many in here are using building data, by the way? Anybody? Yeah, we got a pretty good show of hands here, okay? So, so for those of you who are familiar with that, building data made a change that allowed us to remap our items and put items anywhere we wanted to. It was no longer forced to be local on our C drive, right? In, in, the, in the very beginning, that's how it was, okay? When they made that change right there, whoop, I hit the wrong button, sorry. Um, when they made that change right there, that was huge for us because now we could put that content wherever we wanted to and now we could manage the rest of our content that wasn't managed by building data, okay? So, I say that right there, one of the best changes for us, okay? When that happened, that was huge, okay? Um, it, it was, it was um, a year for us of pain, okay? And we kept thinking, we can educate our users, we can educate people enough to where they won't do this. It did not happen, okay? It, it, it did not happen. We tried and we tried and we tried. And, and we were fighting, in our minds, a losing battle, okay? And, and so, this change right there, remapping that folder, okay, was huge for us. So now, every item we have, every ITM we have in our database is locked, period. Three people have, changed, have the ability to make changes to those items, and that's these three people sitting right here, standing right here. That's it, okay? So 
We're, we are a firm believer in managed content because we can't have end users modifying our content. Okay? So, piping items by default for us are locked and managed by building data. Okay? When we distribute our sheet metal items and our hangers, and I put hangers there because building data has hangers, but we also have additional hangers. So, um, our sheet metal items are locked down through Dropbox. So, Dropbox has the ability to share a folder and to uh, make it non editable by the recipient of that folder, right? So we put all of those <laughs> items into that folder. So they're all in one folder, piping items, email items, hangers, all in the same folder. And we just lock it. They, the user can right click, edit that fitting all day long, but it won't let them save it because they can't write back to that Dropbox folder, okay? Huge for us. <laughs> can't say, can't say enough about that change um, and, and, and the time that it allowed us to go do other things that we needed to be doing already. But we had to keep going back and, and making modifications. And, and for those of you who don't know, um, Dropbox has the ability to go back and see what users modified those items. So it was very easy for us to know which operating company, which individual user made that change? We make, we call them on the phone. It seemed like we were calling the same guy every week sometimes. It's like, it's like come on. Uh, how many times do we have to tell you, do not edit the fittings, right? <laughs> so, okay. We said, we're, we've had enough pain. <laughs> Locking it down. And, of course, it, it caused a little ripple effect, right? People didn't like that. But you know what? They got over it. And now they use it and they don't even think about it anymore. Okay? It's done. They just, we just go with it. Okay? Uh, anything you guys have to add to that? Is that a pretty good explanation of that? I think so. Yeah. I mean, these two guys are standing over here just, you know, in case I forget something, they're supposed to remind me. Okay? So. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, can't, I can't add to that same guy that we, that we threatened the three strikes you're out, but then we felt like we could just pull it through. Yeah. Yeah. We, yeah we, gave, we gave him the three strikes rule. That's right. Um, but it still didn't matter, right? He still had to be an, uh, an employee. We needed him, right? Uh, as, as you know, detailers are hard to find, right? Um, so we couldn't just uh, send him on the road. <laughs> okay, so what, what's some benefits for us for building data, okay? One is accessibility. I, 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 would, I would throw out there that because of Comfort Systems Market, the locations and the quantity of, of operating companies that we have, I would say that from a content standpoint, for a single database, we probably have the largest database of any single one contractor in the United States. Okay, I'll just throw that out there. That's just a gut feeling that I have, okay? Because we're really in some pretty diverse markets um, we're not just a, a standard uh, mechanical uh, plumbing contractor. We, we have a lot of specialty uh, um, operating companies who do some um, out of the box work from a from a typical mechanical contractor standpoint. So we so we have to have a lot of additional data support to support those companies as well. Okay, so um, the other one was speed getting started, and we're gonna. We're going to talk about here in just a second how this whole thing transpired and where we got to where we're at today. But we couldn't have sat down with a team and built the content that we needed to be able to roll out to the amount of companies that we needed to roll out to. It just wasn't going to happen. Okay. So the speed getting started, you know, we hit the ground running. Right. We had to get there as fast as we could. Um, and of course, the amount of data it provides. Not only is it modeling, okay? Um, modeling is just uh, one aspect of what we need from content, right? We also are doing labor, material pricing, and as those of you who know are using building data, you've got the catalog linked with that data as well, so we can go right to the catalog and see 
uh, the manufacturer specs of those particular items, right? So, um, we, this, is, this is a ton of behind the scenes work that needs to be done in order to have a complete ITM, right? If I'm just modeling, that's one thing. But because we've got an integrated database and because we have the ability to use it to uh, forecast, to predict uh, job conditions with labor, with material pricing, things like that, we need all of that data in there, right? We don't want it to be just a model. We've got a lot of extra data that we need there, okay? So that was another aspect for us that um, when we looked at this overall, how do we do this, okay? And the other thing was we didn't need to hire another two or three or four people to sit around and build and update content, okay? That, that was another reason we, we did what we did, okay? So we, it, it, it took a little while, but there, there's the maintaining part, right? It took a little bit, and then we started looking at the downfalls, okay? What, what, what's, the, what's the negative side to this, okay? Well, third-party developer, the lead time, listening to RJ and dealing with RJ. <laughs> okay? But, but notice I strike that out, RJ. Okay? <laughs> Um, no, seriously, um, we don't manage it internally now, right? So we have to we have to rely on somebody else to get us content when we request it, right? We can't just sit down and say, "Hey, um, John, I need you to go build Aquatherm Library for us today." Well, first off, he's probably not going to do it in a day, okay? <laughs> and and secondly. I don't have to worry about having that guy, okay? <coughs> Somebody else is going to do that for us, okay? And so, um, when, when we looked at, you know, the alternatives, right? Build it ourselves, multiple additional employees full-time for the situation that we're in. It may not be for you, because you may just be in that specific little mechanical market, and you only need a certain amount of items, that's fine. But, what happens when that catalog changes? Now I've got to pull somebody off of what they're doing, go through the product list, go through all the items, and check those items and see, are they up to date? Just from a, just from a modeling standpoint, right? Not to mention, did the material pricing code change? Or, um, you know, can we go grab the labor, whether we're using PHCC, MCA, whatever it may be, now we've got a bunch of additional data that we now need to try to inject into our database to make the integrated solution work, right? So, um, anybody, anybody sat down and built a connector from scratch, okay? Can be quite time consuming, right? If you want to, especially on the piping side, if you want to make the, um, the cup depth and the makeup of that copper go into that press fitting the right amount or that solder fitting the right amount and to have everything accurate so that we can prefabricate from it, if you have to sit down and build that connector from scratch, it's going to take you some time, especially if you've never done it before, okay? Even if you have, it still may take you some time if you're building a new library because guess what? It's been a year since you built any content and you forgot all about it, right? What, what was this for? Oh yeah, let me get the manual and let me start looking through this and figure out what the heck, what does setback do, you know? <laughs> so we didn't need to train anybody internally. We could do it, but we didn't need to train anybody internally to do this for us, okay? So just some of the things that as we sat down and started looking at, you know, what do we do? How do we get this going? These are the things that came to mind. Okay? So, let's look at some numbers, right? So, it, 
if we look at these particular manufacturers, if anybody here using any of those product lines right now to draw with? Yeah, quite a few. Does anybody know that every one of those product lines says the dimensional lists have changed in the last month? Has anybody gone back to their content and looked at that? Good? Yeah? Good? So, if not, you're probably going to go home this evening and, or next week and go, uh oh, I better go look at all those manufacturing. Let's see what I got because I got something wrong, right? So, they have changed, okay? Building data, uh, three weeks. I think that was a month, but yeah, maybe it was three weeks. Building data just went back and scrubbed every one of those catalogs from front to back, top to bottom, and updated all that content. We went to the website, we downloaded it. Okay? I, what? Uh, yeah, but probably not in the last three weeks. This, this is just recent. But yes, Viega Pro Press had a big change as well. Correct. Okay? So, that equals 672 fittings with almost 8,000 product listed line items for those manufacturers. Yes, sir? So, how did you guys handle So, one of the issues we saw, kind of like uh, the way the day was changing, but they still have old, old material out there, so you have that funny transition of we're drawing it this way, but they're still sending us old material. How did you guys acknowledge that? Great, great question. So, we built a new PNG for ourselves, okay, an, an item, uh, an item PNG, the, the, the picture that goes with that item, and we put discontinued on that item, okay? Now it's up to our individual operating companies based on their current uh, supplier, how long will I have this discontinued item and when do I need to update to the new one? Okay. They still draw with it. The old one's still there. We don't, we don't, uh, the, the old one will still be there. And we just set it to discontinued and now it's up to the individual company to know when that item for them is no longer deliverable, right? Because they're still going to get it for a while. The, the supplier may have, you know, 300 of them sitting in a crate waiting for this job to start. Well, they're, they're not going to draw with the new fitting. They're going to draw with the old fitting, okay? Now they're going to have a problem somewhere in the interim because they're going to have to switch, right? Where is that going to occur? I, I, I can't tell you that, right? We don't know. But at some point, you're going to have to switch over to that new ITM, okay? But what some other companies have done is reached out to their uh, vendors and specified at this particular date, we no longer want to receive the old ones you may have in stock, say it's like a 90 or 45, whatever it may be, at X, XYZ date, we want to start receiving the new product line. I don't care you know, how many of you have the old ones you have left, but from this day forward, we want to start receiving the new ones, and they start, they start uh, using the new ones and utilizing those and phasing out whatever they may have in-house on, on the previous one. Right. Ship it to your other customer, not to us. As of this date, we're producing spool sheets with the new content. Okay? Ship it to somebody else if you have leftovers, because we don't want them anymore. Right? So. In talking with RJ, okay, I went straight to the source here, it, and thank you RJ for providing this data, but it took building data 280 hours to update those catalogs, okay? And they're good at it. This is what they do every day, okay? My suspicion, if we put that in hours, okay, but I think I had another, um, yeah, here we go. They did it in 280 hours. I'm guessing at best we could train somebody or we could do it ourselves in 450 hours, maybe, okay? Maybe. It may take us longer than that because we don't do it every day, right? We're more concerned about submittals, producing a model, coordinating, prefabricating, spooling, whatever it may be, right? That's what we want to know, okay? So, if you look at those numbers, okay? Building
working day today, approximately $500 a year for renewal. So that's an annual fee that you pay to TSI and building data. 27 stations worth of updates right there for us that, that was taken care of for those few catalog updates. Okay? For, for us, I'll gladly request that all of our companies spend this per year, per station, right? So that I don't have to deal with that other situation, okay? Not just me, but we're gonna talk about the numbers now, I think, next um, on, um, well, actually, we're gonna do standards first and then the numbers. Um, it, 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 it comes down to how much time do we have and, and what's our jobs? What's our job supposed to be? We're supposed to be modeling, coordinating, and, and producing a model for, for pre-fabrication, spooling, whatever it may be. Content happens to drive all of that. And it's a necessity, right? We have to have it, but how do you manage it, okay? As you can see, we are 100% we are on board with managed content. We, we could not do what we do without it, okay? So, um, how many people struggle with creating standards, right? We kind of talked about this in the beginning, right? We only had a few hands show up. I, I, was, I was expecting it to be a little more, like I said earlier. Um, so, by its nature, Comfort Systems has a very autonomous relationship with all of our operating companies, okay? So, the business model that, that's been here since way before my time, um, they, don't, they don't inject a lot of change to the local company. They let the local company in their market do their local thing. They just let them be how, they're gonna, how they are because, uh, first off, if, if they were acquired, they were acquired because, first off, they were making money, um, and secondly, because, you know, the, they probably knew what they were doing, so why change that, right? So that in itself caused us a significant challenge to create standards because everybody wanted to do their own thing, right? They were used to doing their own thing, okay? And so when you talk about pressure classes, layers, colors, plot styles, title blocks, pricing, labor, how are we going to standardize 24 companies across the United States when most people struggle to do one or two internally, right? Where you're at today, most people struggle with that, okay? So, we have a small challenge. So we had a meeting and we started discussing this and I think I've got, I think it's on the next slide um, of, uh, um, no, it's actually right here. Um, so I have to keep looking back at my monitor to make sure we're, where we're at. So when we talk about pressure classes, right, the way we're going to fabricate ductwork, are, are we are we bumping up the gauge to take out the stiffener, or are we leaving it the way that it is to leave the stiffener in, right? What are all of these little things that, for you sheet metal guys, you understand what I'm talking about? How do we want to interpret that SMACNA manual to build ductwork? the most efficient way possible, but also meet all the criteria we needed to meet, right? Okay? Um, layers and colors. When you set up the fabrication database, you got the option, right? Everybody can put whatever color they want in there for whatever system they want, okay? So, we did that. We have services set up that has layers and colors and they're used across the board now in Comfort Systems. Okay? In the beginning, we had some pushback, believe me. Okay? And we said, you, you can do it when you create your profile. You can go into your profile and you can change the colors because you want it supplied up to be green versus blue or whatever. You can go do that on every profile you create. Guess what? Over time, People just say, you know what, I'll just use it the way it is. It's okay. It's not, 
it's really not it's really not that big of a deal that I change that color anymore. Okay. <laughs> And, and so by default, okay, so by default, because we delivered something to them that worked, and if they didn't make any changes to it, it still worked, and it was less work for them to use it the way it was, they changed. Okay? We didn't mandate it. We, we didn't tell them, right? We're, we've got this autonomous relationship going here, right? We can't go in and tell you this is how you're going to do it, okay? But people are lazy. They want to be. They want to get their job done as quickly as possible. And what's the easiest way to get it done as quickly as possible? Use it just like it comes, <laughs> right? <laughs> so in, in, in the beginning, we, we had some, we really had some pushback on this. And then uh, over time, yep. People just started conforming, okay? It, it, it just happened. We'd go back in and they're like, I said, well, you're using a different color here. Oh, no, we're, we're using your colors now. We're using your plot styles, okay? We're using your layers. Yeah, we're just, we're running with what you have. We've adapted to it and everything's great. Okay, so that's good, okay? So, 16 different title blocks we had to deal with. <laughs> We finally got it down to one. It took us a year for everybody to decide how we wanted to lay out our title block and which way, where we were going to put the the uh, the um, revision numbers and where we were going to put the logos and where we were going to put this and that. I'm like, really? Is it that difficult? I don't get it, right? Anyway, we pushed that back out to our users and after a year, they finally came back to us because they collectively decided this is the title block we want to use moving forward. Great, fine, right? Okay, so we showed a while ago, uh, we came over, I started in May, I believe, of 2013, okay? And in traveling around to the different operating companies, realized right away that uh, I would go to Colorado, or I'd go to Phoenix, or I'd go to San Diego, whatever it may be. Every company that I was going to had a different database. I was answering the same questions, whether it was on reports, whether it was on design line setup, whether it was on um, service setup, service templates, whatever it may be, I was answering the same questions at each of the locations. And I, I mean, it felt like I was spinning my wheels because I wasn't getting anywhere, right? I mean, I was just taking them from, from here to here, but we weren't making huge strides in improvement and the whole next goal, which was the productivity side, right? So, um, we, we started in February of 2014. We, we, brought, we brought fabrication shops together in a location, and we had them all sit down and agree. When we build a square throat elbow, it'll have default six inch strokes. Does everybody in this room agree? Yes, okay, we'll go to the next one, okay? Done. When we draw a transition, we're going to draw a default 18 inches long. Does everybody agree? Oh, well, that caused a big discussion. Well, we needed this, we needed that. We understand that, but by default, let's, let's come up with a plan here, right? The square tap, okay? We go on and on and on, okay? What kind of connector do we want on that square tap, okay? Do we want inside hammer lock? Do we want um, one inch flange out? Do we want one and a half inch flange out? What are we going to put on that tap on the side of that square up, okay? We went through all of these things, okay? Believe me, it was a long three days, okay? And we didn't finish, okay? We didn't finish, right? It, it, it wasn't even close. But, a little side note, when we were at that meeting, and we were talking about Dropbox earlier, we had already set up at that point in time, we had already put into Dropbox a preliminary database, okay? We set up our folder structure and we shared it with the attendees of that meeting, okay? And our fear was that Dropbox was going to fail in certain things that we were doing with the database, okay? And we had tested it internally ourselves, but we hadn't tested it on a grander scale, so to speak, okay? So we get into this room, we got everybody in there, and we said, okay, we feel like the time that this potentially might fail is when we create a profile. Because 
everybody there is accessing that main database at the same time, taking files out of that main database and creating that profile. So we said, okay, let's do a test. So we had everybody, if anybody's created a profile, you know, right click profile new and you, you go tick the boxes that you want to bring over services, right? You get all that stuff done. We had everybody get to that point and just stop. We said, okay, on the count of three, we want everybody to hit OK at the same time, right? We're going to test it. We're going to find out, okay? If it's going to fail, it's going to fail because we've got 15 people accessing and, and taking data out all at the same time. What's the chances that that's going to happen nationwide that we have this happen, that somebody's creating profiles simultaneously? Well, we forced it, right? We did a couple of other tests, but that was one. And it worked. It passed. We were, we were excited, like, oh yeah, okay, we're, we're, we're making some, we're making it, right? We're getting somewhere. So, um, when, when, when we started this, from February to April, we were setting all those standards up now. We were building pressure classes, building connectors, building seams, notches, on and on and on, okay? In April, we had to figure out, okay, now we've got to get this thing out to people. How do we start this process, okay? Because now, now we have a situation where we've got a corporate database with all of our standards in it, and we have 10 or 15, maybe 20 different operating companies that are running their own database today. Still, right? They've got their own thing doing their own thing. And we've just been letting them continue doing that while we were building this. So now we said, okay, what do we do, right? So William and I, um, sat down, started looking at a calendar. And at this time, Josh wasn't traveling as much as William and I. And we said, okay, William, if you go to two companies a week, no, we started off with, first we were gonna do the installations, because now we needed to be on site to help get everything set up and show them all the new configuration and how it was all gonna work. When we started looking at the schedule and the amount of companies that we needed to go to, it was about six or eight months worth of travel time for us just to get the initial rollout done for the database. And we said, oh, hold on, time out. That ain't going to work. We, we, we got to get this thing out faster than this. So we stopped and created training videos, OK? So William and I, William recorded them. I edited them for three or four weeks, I think. We made. Configuration videos, profile setup videos, design line training, uh, basic training, spooling, you name it. We made, we made training videos. Posted them online, got them all up there, and we said, okay, now we got the training part taken care of. Now how do we distribute, okay? So we worked out a schedule. He went to two companies a week. I went to two companies a week, setting up and accepting Dropbox folders, setting everything up, setting the configuration, and showing people at least the start. Okay, here's the videos. Go watch the videos. We'll be back later. Okay? So we did that. Then, we even had some online uh, installs and setup as well. Okay? So that was a big challenge. A, a, a huge undertaking. Um, so, all of this standards came with that new database, right? Okay? So, then, once we, once we got that done, now we knew that each operating company, when we showed up on site, we, we, had, a, we had a way to, to validate and verify that they had watched the videos, and we knew that when we showed up on site, they at least had a basic to mid-level understanding of how this database worked and how we were going to distribute it and how they were going to use it. Okay? It was already all done. That groundwork was done for us because we created the videos. And we had, there's over 100 people, I believe, um, watching videos simultaneously for, for weeks on end until we started actually visiting the operating companies. And then we knew Hey, you remember, remember watching this in the video? Oh yeah, I remember that. Okay, well let us now take you to the next level and let's advance that. Okay, let, let, let's, let's take you to another level. Okay? And so the videos for us 
we're, we're huge, okay? Yeah, we had to stop and create them. But when we created them, we created them with the database that we rolled out so that it worked. <laughs> and when they clicked on this button or that button, the database worked just like the video showed, okay? When we drew design line, when we did multi-point fill, when we did, you know, any of the commands within the software, it functioned just like the video showed. It wasn't that, oh man, I gotta stop, I gotta back up, oh yeah, I forgot my button code on that, or my button mapping, whatever it may be. They didn't have to worry about any of that, right? It was already all done. So it functioned and it worked. So what did that do? That gave them reassurance that, oh, maybe these three guys do know a little bit about what they're doing, right? So, so then, now it started, now it was visits to the, to, the, to, to the operating companies, right? And so let's look at, let, let's talk about the content pack, right? Yes, sir. So when you, you roll up the database, so last year had a transition of existing database to a new database. So you have existing jobs. And theoretically, there are two databases. And historically, two communication databases, you can corrupt those jobs, or active jobs. Brand new job. Brand new database. Brand new database. Yeah. So, so we knew there was going to be that transition. Okay, keep using what you got, right? We, we know that. Finish it out. Some people were just starting, and we tell them, hey, you know what? If you're just starting, you'd be better off. Rev design what you have. Take those rev designs out. Let's go to the new database, fill in 3D, and now we're running on a brand new database. Yeah. All right, let's go. We Off did, and running. We did have some of that. We had some jobs, you know, that they've been working on for a month or six weeks already, and this was going to be a year and a half project. So yes, we did have some of that to go back into the right scripts to small path data and things like that. And, and and we we had some of them transition on floors, right? Finish out this floor. When you go to the new floor, just know you're going to use the new configuration, the new database. Okay. Counting on them and logging them to pick the right database. Bingo. Absolutely. I've got a user there that uh, is going to pick the right database. Uh, well, yeah. well that, that, that was part of the training. That, 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 was, that was part of the process. And again, you, you heard my, my gripes a while ago about content. Well, now we had the same thing with the database. And, and of course, we'd get the calls man, my file sizes are just getting huge. Well, what'd you do? Well, last week I opened it with the wrong database. Yeah, okay. You know what? Copy, clip everything out, start a brand new drawing, and open it with the right database, and now on you won't have that problem, right? So, so yeah, there, there was a transition period here, right? So, what, what, what I want to get to here is, out of the box, okay, building data delivers a, uh, a content pack. There we go, I was looking for the term, okay? You got a content pack for building data. So we're gonna talk about, we're gonna talk about the numbers and the differences between where the default install is, if you start with building data tomorrow and you get a default install out of the box, here's where we are versus where they are, okay? So when we talk about the accessories, we've got a few more, okay? Not, not too many more. Um, drainage fittings, yeah, we're, you know, 3,500 more, no, 2,500, right? About. Okay. These are these are these are items. Okay. These are not these are not um, inclusive of the product list. These are just individual items. So one item might have uh, two two size ranges in it. Some of these items might have fifty ranges sizes in it. Right. Um, hangers. So you see, you know, we we've, we've downloaded more hangers. Plus we've built some ourselves to to accommodate situations. Uh, pipes were almost similar, so that's just your straight uh, your straight pieces. Now we start varying, okay? So pressure fittings, we're, we're almost double, right? On, on the amount of content that we have in our current uh, database versus um, there, almost 4,000 more valves than what comes in the out of the box uh, content pack from TSI and again this all stems on all the different operating companies and 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 the jobs that they work on and, and the types of materials and things that they need right um, so 
about 7,500 items in the out-of-the-box install from uh, TSI, okay? We're, we're over 20,000, okay? So, so when we talk about building content, okay, there's no way we can keep up, okay? It, it's just, it, it, it's, it, it's absolutely imperative for us, and I, and I realize that, that in our situation, we're, we might be, we, well, we probably are unique in, in, the, in, in all of the markets that we work in, but I can see where if you're doing it, you're spending time, that that, that might pay off too, right? <coughs> Just because of the amount of items we can go to. So this is what was striking to me. Anybody familiar with MapRod, right? You know, you know what MapRod is? It stores all your uh, um, additional data for the items, okay? So estimating, um, nah, the list can go on and on. I'm not gonna get into all of that, right? But 121,000 line items. So this is every product listed item in the database, okay? We're at almost 260,000 line items, and that's taken a well bent elbow and every size range from two inch, three inch, four inch, all the way up to 48 or whatever it may be, okay? So when you talk about managing content, that's a lot of content to keep up with, okay? And I gotta say, Josh, does a tremendous job of that, okay? Because when, when Josh downloads items from building data, he also validates that it has the correct pricing, the correct labor, whatever it may be, on those items before it gets distributed to our users. So that we know at the time they start producing a model with that, it's done, it's ready to go, okay? If I produce that spool sheet, I'm gonna get my labor hours on that spool sheet, okay? It's done, it's there. Okay, so let's talk about let's talk about where we're at. Okay, come on. All right. So we keep talking about this national database, right? Let, let's give you some numbers of where we're at with this guy. And uh, some of you may know this, some of you may not know this in your current situation. Um, if we look at CAD and EP alone. 131 users across the United States, okay? That's CAD stations, right? Under CAMDUCT, we have 17 CAMDUCT stations. We have nine coil lines and 14 plasma tables running off of the same database, okay? I, I, I think that's just incredible that, that first off, Somehow we've figured out how to make that happen, but secondly, that somehow behind the scenes, the software is capable of doing that. Because most people will tell you, oh, you can't do that. You can't have that many people running that. It doesn't run. We, we've tried it. It doesn't do this. It doesn't do that. Well, guess what? It does. <laughs> okay? Um, it, 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 if you're an organization that has two or three branch locations, I think you should think about the distribution, what you're doing with that, and what we're doing with it, and look back and say, well, maybe I need to make some changes to what I'm doing, okay? So, 18 remote entries. We're just getting started here on the tracker side of remote entry. Um, for those of you who don't know, remote entry being the, the ability to enter fittings for a superintendent or a, a foreman in the field and be able to send that to CAMDUCT electronically as an REJ file and they just open that file and nest it and burn it. Okay, it's done. They don't have to do any manual input at the, at the shop. Okay? So we think that number down here, these numbers are going to, especially this one, is going to increase significantly because we just started that the first of this year. Okay, so we just got it out in a, in a few uh, locations. Uh, same with estimating, um, even though we've had all the data there, as most people know, the estimating side, uh, it's difficult to get estimators to change, so I'll put it that way. Um, but um, 
we, we're, we're starting to see a pretty big push on our side in questions and, and inquiries about the estimating side and what can we do and when can you get to us and when, when can we start with that, okay? So we see estimating and remote entry probably um, growing for us uh, fairly significantly here between um, the, this year and uh, starting um, the, the first of next year. Um, so, th this right here, okay, when we talk about CAM and plasma tables and coil lines, um, a little story, when William hired on, uh, William says, at the interview, William says, well, I'm pretty good at CAD, or I'm pretty good at EST, these other things we'll figure out, but I'm not so good at CAM. So what do we put William to doing? William's our cam guy now, okay? That was his weak point. Now he knows more about cam up than me or Josh probably put together, okay? Um, so, so he's taken that, he's learned it, he's ran with it, and um, he's been instrumental in setting up and modifying most of those plasma tables and coil lines to work with this one database, okay? So um, that's a that's a... A, a big task right here to make this happen, okay? So, um, again, it takes a team, right? We, could, we couldn't do it uh, single-handedly, right? So, let's talk about the internal workings of the database, right? How did we get this to work for so many companies, okay? We have 122 sheet metal services in our global database, okay? And so when somebody takes that out, they have those services to start with, and they modify slightly if needed, and they start drawing a job. They're done, okay, when they get to the profile, okay? So there's not a lot of modifications that needs to be done there, okay? 214 mechanical piping and plumbing services, okay? So uh, that can range from a, a plumbing service being just copper, sweat copper, or propressed copper, to combination systems, a, a mechanical piping system that's uh, welded by grooved, I mean, uh, welded by threaded, a grooved by threaded, uh, uh, welded by uh, press fit, whatever it may be. So we have all of those default services set up and ready to go for them, okay? Um, this is a big one, we're going to talk about this here in a minute. 240 sheet metal specifications, okay? That number doesn't grow up for us though, because what, when we take that out of global, the end user can take 99% of the time, takes those sheet metal specifications right there and draws a job, we're done. Don't go modify it, don't go do anything to it, don't mess with it, okay? Most people, most people, and, I, and I would, I, I'd probably say most of you in this room, you take your specifications, you make a copy of that, you put your job number in front of it because something changed on that specification for that job. Is that true? Most of you probably do that, right? Okay? We don't do that. Okay? We're going to get to why we don't do that here in a minute. Okay? Um, Ten sheet metal templates. That's all we need. Okay, so that's one for supply, one for return, right? You have different grills, you got different things on there. That's it, that's all we need, okay? Um, 94 mechanical piping and plumbing templates. Sorry, I talked about templates over here. These are the services, so that's chill water, heating water, condenser water, right? That's what this is. The templates being welded by copper, welded by threaded, whatever it may be. So there's 94 of those in our global database, okay? So the end user, when they create their profile, we may have a Victaulic or a Milwaukee butterfly valve in there, but they've got a job that requires something else. They make that change in that profile and it doesn't affect our national database, okay? They make that change at their local company and they're done. Rock and roll, go. Don't look back, okay? So, 85 processes. We got we got 
we have a slide here in a minute to show you the processes, but for any of those who are looking at or know under, and understand CAM, you know that processes can run scripts, they can do lots of things for you. Um, we, we, we utilize processes, and I'll say there's probably three or four processes per um, operating company. Yeah, there we go. Per operating company, uh, just on the sheet metal shops alone. Okay, and then we've got a bunch of additional processes in there that we build for productivity tools and things like that, right? Okay? So, okay. yep? How do you guys manage your uh, colors? How do we manage colors? You, can, we, you have 255 colors, and you need to plot mainly, you know, your light fitness is based on your color. So okay. You have all those services. How, do you use the same color or any different services? A absolutely. You, you have to, right? So, so we're, so we're going we're gonna to use color 32 on plumbing, but we're also going to use 32 on sheet metal, right? It's going to happen. We're going to have some crossovers of colors, okay? Without a doubt, there's yeah, there's only Autodesk only gives us two fifty five. Two yeah, two fifty five. There we go. Yeah. Okay? So yeah, and, and and we actually have an Excel spreadsheet that we put together that has tabs on it that has every system and every color assigned to it already. So if somebody takes out for a particular job and they need to build um, some special exhaust or whatever it may be. They just go to our spreadsheet, look at the color, and plug it in, we're done. Okay? It, it, we, we make it as simple as possible, right? <laughs> we make it easy. If we make it easy, everything works, right? So, additional tools needed, right? We, we, we gotta get we gotta get to um, some of the projects and things we're doing, but we built our own ribbon, okay? And on our ribbon, we built all of our own annotation buttons, okay? And so those annotations are in model space or paper space, okay, depending on what the operating company wants to do. I can tell you, uh, when's my class? Tomorrow sometime? If you come to my class tomorrow, uh, it's about Ultimate Academy P texting. You might change your mind about what you're doing now unless you're already doing texting in paper space, okay? Uh, we, we might change your mind and you might start doing all of your annotations in paper space after the class. But anyway, uh, we, we got pull downs here, so we did little fly outs of each one of these, okay? So each one of these does specific things, right? Um, and, you know, fab batch numbers, we got hangers, we got, you know, set rod height, adjust, you know, hanger rod adjust, uh, insulation adjust, we got all these things that are, that are helping the end user do more things with the database that they would have to go click on things and make changes manually, guess what? We can do it with scripting and processes, and we can fix these things on the fly, okay? Um, so set stop depth. Uh, bought out's an interesting one because we have so many different companies. Not everybody buys out the same items, right? Some of them build them, some of them buy them. So we've got a way to apply the bought out list, or they can do it manually because they buy out their spin ins versus building them or whatever it may be, okay? So we do have some unique things that we have to deal with just because of the diversity of where we're at, okay? Um, so we got, you know, NC reports, linear nest reports. So these are all things that they can just pull off the ribbon and go and, and you know, it, it, we, we've, done the, we've done the homework for you, right? Use the tools. When we were talking about 85 processes, for those of you who are, who are in CamDuct or in estimating, if you've ever looked at that, there's our list of processes, okay? Quite significant, okay? So, you can see here, you know, if you take southeast, you got three or four or five processes. You got Dynatid, you know, three or four or five processes. We've got these down here at the bottom, the Z stuff, that's ours. That's, that's what we do corporately, and we put them in ribbons and things like that. So we can keep track of which process does what. We know, what, we know where ours are, okay? Um, we took the scripting class with Ian. Is Ian in here? I think Ian was sitting over here. I think he walked out. Um, we took, it, we took a scripting class with Ian right after we got to Comfort Systems because we knew uh, we were going to need some help. And from that, we've written around 200 scripts. We just took a screenshot of our folder here just to kind of show you some of, the, some of the things, you know, set status in production, set bought out, you know, uh, set required date, uh, unlock specs, you know, whatever it may be, right? So all these things that we use on a daily basis, you know. So that's just in our 
our bag of, of, of tools that we can use uh, to make things happen. This was probably the biggest thing that has helped us uh, by taking that scripting class, and it's something called a parameter file. Okay? Um, so we have the ability for scripting. This, this Excel spreadsheet creates a text file. Okay? Scripting reads this and says, okay, what do you want to do with the particular fitting? And I'm going to get into a, 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 a a, a, a perfect case scenario, but because we have so many different shops and so many different locations, we've got all different kinds of veins. We've got all different kinds of ceiling, depending on where we're at, right? Everybody wants to use their own. So what was that going to do for us? That was going to um, increase exponentially our services, our, our, our pressure classes that we were going to have to build, because each one of those needed to have that particular seam or, or um, uh, vein or whatever it may be. So the parameter file saves us a ton when it comes to that, right? Um, William is going to talk more about this um, right here in this room, sharing the fabrication database via the cloud. He's going to talk a little bit more um, about that parameter file as well, okay? So we distributed it. Uh, we looked at all the different cloud services, okay? We've been talking about Dropbox. We looked at all of these, okay? Did some testing, did, you know, went through our, uh, our our process. That was the one. Okay, close second, close second. Okay, um, we looked at this single server replication, RoboCopy, all these things that we're having to do on the server side. How do we get this thing distributed? It all came back to Dropbox. Okay, and again. I put it in there again just to make sure. Go see William's class because he's going to talk specifically about some some additional things on that, right? Um, so when we talk about managing that global database, everything starts from global, okay? And so when we talk about global, that's the global setting, right? You either work in global or you work in a profile, right? Everything starts in global. Most of it. Managing the people, right? Just like you said earlier, uh, Dave, I guess he, he left, but how, how do we get the user to know which configuration to use? How do we get them to start the software properly? How do we do all these things? Well, it's managing the people, right? Getting the people to do the right things and things work well, okay? Um, they create their own project-specific profiles, which does not impact our global database. So once they get it into that profile, they can make all the changes they want and everything's fine. We don't have additional services, service templates, pressure classes, connector, whatever it may be, on and on and on our global database. It stays clean because all of that work is done in the profile. Um, so um, we deal with the enhancements, right? Anytime a new service pack comes out, we go through, we test it, we validate it, and we send out an email with a little Word document or something, hey, here's some new features, this is how this works, and you can use it if you want to, right? Um, this is a big one. one. One administrator per company. Okay? You don't know how many times in, in my previous life uh, with TSI and where I'm currently here today before we rolled out the new database, how many companies had more people than one or maybe two that had access to that database and could make changes to it? Okay? Too many, too many hands in the cookie jar, right? Okay? We gotta keep it. We gotta keep it limited, so that you can train one person and understand that 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 one person is going to do what you ask him to do. Okay. Uh, this is an interesting one that we have and deal with. Pricing and labor is static in a profile. Whenever we create that profile, it takes out cost.map, supplier.map, a couple of other .map files, right? And that pricing is static in that profile at that point in time. So that profile goes on for a year. That pricing and labor is not going to update, even though we're updating it in global. Okay? But we have ways to get that into that profile. If somebody comes to us and says, hey, we, we need some updated material pricing and labor in our, in our profile, hey, not a problem. We can help you out. Okay? So um, can't say enough about how many times Dropbox has saved the day. Um, somebody deleted a bunch of files in Dropbox. Okay? 
um, we were able to go back into Dropbox. We had, we, we had how many? 130 CAD people plus 17 CAM users. Everybody shut down. The whole entire company was shut down because folders went away. Less than 45 minutes, maybe an hour. We were able to restore all of those files and have them all back up and running and everybody back up and running. Now, how many people have lost data on the server and had to go to the IT department and can you get it within an hour? <laughs> Not going to happen, is it? Okay? You're lucky if you can get it the next day, maybe, right? Huh? You're lucky if you can get it. You're lucky if you can even get it, right, because they tell you they're doing a backup, but are they in fact doing a backup, right? Okay? So, William and Josh and I have had several, we, we call them fire drills. <laughs> And when it's fire drill, it's it's literally fire drill. We got we got problems, okay? And we stop everything that we're doing, and we fix the problem, whatever that problem might be. Even even smaller than that, if you you know you're in the database, you do something, you click OK, you <laughs> reply and OK, and then you're like, <laughs> that's not what I wanted. I did that, or, or that's not what I wanted. With the restoring capabilities, you know, go right in there, find the, the previous file, and literally within seconds, click restore, and you're right back to where you were versus. You know how many hours of trying to manually go back and, and, and fix all that stuff. Yeah, we, we, can't, we can't say enough about what that's done for us in, in, in more ways than one, right? So keys to the success, right? Managing the content, or managed content, okay, I'll put it that way. Profiles. We, we could not do what we're doing if it was not for Profiles, okay? And, and if you haven't looked at Profiles in a while, I would suggest that you go back Look at profiles, see what they do. Um, word of caution, don't tick the box that says copy entire, copy all. There you go. Don't take that box. Because <laughs> you basically just replicated your whole entire database. You want to use the same items, right? There's, there's options in there. If you ever created a profile, go through that. Uh, use the same items because you don't want to be copying those items around, right? Um, reports, scripts, parameter file. And of course, the new building data store, um, th this is going to be pretty significant for us. Uh, Josh is going to talk about that today here in this room at 1130, but being able to have any of our operating companies go in, click on fittings, send a request for those, and Josh gets that request and now he can go download content. So they don't have to send us a PDF or type all this out in an email or whatever it may be. It, it, it's similar to going and looking at the at the building data store online, but on there you couldn't you couldn't actually request fittings as, as an end user, um, only the admin, right? So um, so here was an example of a pressure class um, and a parameter file. The number of pressure classes would grow exponentially without us using this parameter file. Okay, we use the same pressure class files for every project. Doesn't matter what project it is, we use the same pressure files. Okay and we modify it with a parameter file, okay? So, right now we told you earlier we had 240 specs, right? If we started building all of those specs with the 11 different veins that we have across the country, we have 2,640 specs in our database. Now we take those and we add 23 different sealants and now we're at 60,000 specs. As you can see, we don't want these numbers, okay? No way. <laughs> it's crazy. Now, now we took it at face value. We could argue that, okay, maybe some of these wouldn't be duplicated, but still, even if we took half of those numbers and we took half of that number, that's still way too many specifications to have in the database, okay? Fresh process, whatever you want to say, right? okay? So, so, uh, can't say enough about what Ian taught us with that parameter file. Remember Ian San Antonio a couple of years ago? Yes? Okay. Um, we took it and we ran with it, okay? So again, no 26 gauge allowed. You can set it per the job or you can set it per company. We have, we have two and William's gonna go through this um, in, in more detail. Um, and then the veins and the sealant, you set it here. We run a main script at the end at CAM. CAM changes all of this, okay? 
So it comes across, all the fittings come to our shop with all the default pressure class on them. And then the script modifies it all and we burn it. Done. Okay? So you literally click of a button for the shop now. Okay? He runs the script. And it modifies all of his fittings based on what he has set up in this parameter bar. Okay? So updating. Everything occurs in global. We've talked about that. Uh, Dropbox. Everything's instant, right? As soon as we make a change, all the users have that change. Okay? It, it just, as soon as it syncs, right? As long as we're online and it syncs, right? It's done. Um, Josh updates MCA and Harrison pricing in global. Uh, button repair path tool, we were talking about those discontinued items earlier. We have to remap some items and we have to remap those items even in profiles, right? Because they created a profile and it was mapped to an item that uh, potentially doesn't exist anymore. It's discontinued, right? So now we have to remap if they want that new item, we have to remap that. So we use the button repair path tool, okay? So each company makes their own profiles. Currently we have 409 profiles active in our database right now, okay? Doesn't matter, okay? Doesn't matter. All of those profiles are using the exact same items. So when we go make a change to an item, Every one of those 409 profiles is updated, done. They click on that hanger, they click on that elbow, they get that new item because we updated it, done, okay? It, it, it's brilliant, I can't say enough about that, right? Um, you can read down through your ancillaries, sheet metal insulation, material pricing, all of these things are all updated in the global side, okay? And, and every time they create a new profile, project specific, they get the new data, okay? So then, obviously, we have to look at do they need the new data in old profiles, and we, and we work with people on that, okay? So, some examples, uh, data exports, take it out, you know, total odd, all thread rod, all the sizes, all the lengths, um, the um, pipe lengths, what it is, carbon steel, this, that, the other, um, setting up some uh, pivot tables in Excel. Again, we, we've done all this homework for you. Okay? On our side, right? These are just things that the end users get to take advantage of. Okay? Um, fabrication reports. So we built uh, Clevis hanger reports where, you know, rod A, rod B, the width, the rod in from the end, we put the picture on the report and print the report. We're done. Prefabric hanger. Okay? So um, linear or uh, duct testing square footage, right? Just showing you some examples of some of the things that we've got here, right? So. We need to do the testing. We don't need a guy sitting down uh, manually cal calculating up how many square footage it is. Window it. We're done. Okay. Uh, same thing with the piping. We gave him a picture of the clevis hanger. Get all the data on there. Build the hanger. Okay. Let's go. Um, job information. We build our own custom form. We don't use the, the default one out of the box. We built our own because there's a lot of additional data that we need on all of our reports and things, and we want that data to be specific for everybody. So. When somebody hits job information, if they don't see the screen that's got blue on it on our side, they got the wrong job information form, okay? The data you enter is not going to go in the reports and the headers and all the locations where it needs to go. It's not going to work, okay? So again, a little bit of training for um, the, uh, um, the people. So I think we got, what, 15 minutes left or something? About four? Uh oh. Okay. So here, so here we go. Yeah. Uh, right out of time as usual. Okay. So we were going to run through some projects. Of course, we do. You know, um, hangers, uh, um, sectioning of duct work. You know, putting together um, uh, sections of duct skids. Right. We're doing all of these things um, here at Comfort. Some of them um, starting out new. Some of them been doing this for a while. Um, don't have time, but that was an interesting story on that one. Um, <laughs> so, so let's get into some of the comfort systems, uh, specifically EAS over in Greensboro, North Carolina. Um, they do something called off-site construction, and they're and they're very good at it. Um, so basically, what they're doing is they're figuring out what parts of the building can we take and and manufacture off-site while the rest of the building is being built, and then we'll deliver it to you when you're ready, 
Okay? So, uh, obviously, construction schedule, you know, labor, no weather delays because it's all built inside the building. Okay? So, uh, here was a Duke University example. I want to highlight a couple of things here. They, they, they put a uh, unit on top of the roof that was 66 by 38 by 12 foot high. Okay? So, that's an air hammer unit. Uh, first shutdown started 6 p.m. on Friday. They finished on Sunday, uh, two days to finish. Um, I think one more slide here I've got that shows the, um, uh, there's the university, that, there's a picture of that unit sitting on top of their roof. All prefab and manufactured at, a, at an off-site location and delivered and, and, and flew in, okay? So, here's how they do it, okay? In the manufacturing facility, they start from the ground up. So they build skids, they build the steel, all the structural supports, and they fly these modules in and set them in place, okay? So everything here is tested, commissioned, it's, it's hooked up in the manufacturing facility, water's ran through it, power, everything functions. So when this gets to the site, we make connections, we bolt the units together, and we're off and running, okay? So, um, again, this one was 17 units that was built together. So here's four chillers that are put together. Uh, you can see the pumps and everything all over here on the other side. I got some other pictures of that as well. So there's, there's, there's looking down the chillers and all the pumps sitting on the side. So this was all built off-site and flown in in, in, in modules and, and hooked up, okay? So, um, there it is, There's, there it is out on site, right? So, there's some of the air hammer units. There was 17 of these set on the top of that data center, okay, as, as units. So, um, you know, all the frames for the cooling towers, you can see the pieces underneath, so those were all the modules that were, that were built and put together. I did have a video. Uh, I think we're almost out of time. Um, so, um, I can start the video. I know we're getting ready to go to break. You're more than welcome to, you know, go to break if you want to. I'll see if I can start the video. I struggled with this a little bit earlier. Um, if you want to, I think it's about a seven or eight minute video, so it's up to you if you want to uh, hang around and watch it. Um, and um, we'll be up here possibly to uh, answer questions as well. So let me get this moved over. Here. CBRE, here's the site to show you a rapidly emerging trend in the data center industry. Behind me, you'll see the team putting together the finishing touches on the installation of a one megawatt tier four data center. Just 10 days ago, this entire structure was on the floor of our fabricator, and in two more days, full commissioning of the building will begin. Right next to the new structure is an additional one megawatt unit that was completed just last year. It has been in full operation for the last 10 months, and the client is ready to add additional capacity. The new structure will be in place right next to the original, and when complete, the space will be continuous in two be. megawatt data center. The advantages to this approach include faster deployment, easier expansion, greater customization, capital information, and predictable quality control. Is this available? Yeah, we were sorry. 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 Yeah, we were sorry.
So my name is Jared Morris. I was the uh, civil engineer director for this project with Olson Associates. With this particular project, there is a number of interesting, unique things that we had to solve a problem with as it related to the center for the house. When they're placed on the site, we were heavily involved on the geotechnical assessment on the project, which involved testing the soils to make sure that the bearing capacities were uh, adequate to support the loads of these center for units. Now let's meet with Brian, one of the on-site construction team members, to show how it's going.